There are certain stories that once you read them in scripture, they sort of grab you, and you always remember them. And you look at, and they always come back to them. And if you if you think have to think of a Bible story, what's the first Bible story you think of? I mean, there, those are those types of stories. For whether it's the lost sheep that is found, the shepherd goes seeking the one lost sheep, leaves the ninety nine behind, or or when Lazarus comes out of the grave and his sisters weeping turns from a tears of, of sorrow to tears of joy, or when Thomas asks to put his fingers in Jesus' side. We have, we these stories they capture our imagination. <clears throat> they capture our imagination because we, we, we see ourselves in those stories. We are the prodigal son who was embraced and brought home. Or they shock us and surprise us. Thomas asked to do what? And put his fingers where? I mean, so in one of the stories that for me is surprising, I remember reading it the first time and it just kind of grabbed me, it is this moment in the story that we read earlier. This moment when Jesus is walking along with his disciples, just walking along, just, just, hang, just going to the next town. And as they're going into the next town, a, a local official comes to meet them. Someone who has a little bit of authority, kind of dressed nice, has a, has a position of some sort, and, and shows up and goes up to Jesus. And he doesn't start off with, hey, my name is, or, or how you doing, or welcome to so-and-so. He, he goes right in with, Rabbi, what must I do to have eternal life? When someone starts a, question, a discussion with, what must I have to have eternal life? That, you know there's a little bit of weight there. There's a little bit of pressure. You don't usually start small talk with, so, eternal life, heaven. I mean, and so he comes up and he, he just launches into this. And so obviously there's some pressure behind it. He is worried about it. And Jesus starts to answer. And he says, if you want to have eternal life, well, he starts going through the latter half of the Ten Commandments. You know, don't steal don't lie, take care of your parents. And, and he, he, he jumps in, he cuts Jesus off and says, no, 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 I've, I've done all of that. I've done all that since I was a boy. I mean, that, that's, and I'm sure Jesus gets interrupted often. And this is just one more time. And Jesus continues saying, well, if you've done all of those latter half of those Ten Commandments, the latter half of the Ten Commandments have all to do about loving your neighbor, then let us look at those first couple commandments. You know the part about loving God. You shall have no other God before you. Take the Sabbath to worship God. Don't make any false idols. So the, the, if you're loving your neighbors, let's look at how you're loving God. And if you're going to love God for you, I think you need to give away what you're holding on to. And I, my understanding is he's talking about this guy has an idol, that the money has become an idol and he needs to let go of it so he can love God. And here is the moment that I find intriguing. Here is the moment that is just so very interesting to me. Because here is the point at which Jesus has given him the answer. What should I do to have eternal life? Here, do this. Sell and then follow me. This is the invitation. And here is the moment at which the disciples are looking at this guy... And people's lives have been changed before when Jesus asks a question, right? When Jesus sits down to have a meal with, with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus walks out having given away half of what he owns and promising to give, what, give back five, fourfold anyone who he has ripped off. I mean, when, when Jesus asks these 12 fellows who are following him, when Jesus asks them, give up everything and follow me, they said, yes, sir, and we're along for the ride. And so this moment when Jesus is asking this rich young fellow, this official, to make this radical change and follow him, there's every expectation that it could happen. And they might, these 12 disciples, they may be looking at disciple number 13 right there. And so in this sort of pregnant moment, as they're pausing to see how the guy's going to respond, he turns. And I found this painting I want you to see of this moment. It's this moment. He turns and he starts to walk away. He has been made, he's, hit, he's got the answer to this question. He doesn't like the answer. He has been invited to follow Jesus, and now he's walking away. And what do you do if you're one of the 12 disciples there? You're watching the guy walk away thinking, huh? He's walking away on Jesus? And then what do you do next? You look at Jesus. And what's Jesus do here? Does Jesus holler at him? Hey, come on back! Does Jesus chase him down? Does Jesus run after him? No. This is the moment. The guy has been invited to follow Jesus, told the expectations. 
He says no, walks away, and Jesus doesn't chase him down. This is a fascinating moment for me. And then, and then, then it continues on, and, and you can tell the disciples are really worked up about this because they start asking questions. Well, if he can't be saved, can we be saved? And then we get this whole, well, camel, can you shove a camel through the eye of a needle? Oh my God, are we doomed? Well, with God, all things are possible. And we have this just interesting discussion that happens here. And there are so many parts of this scripture. We could spend a month just on this, this verse, this, these verses. I mean, Jesus says, don't call me good. And why does Jesus say this? Only God is good. We could look at, you know, when Jesus says, give up everything, does that apply to us? Should I write a check for my total net worth? Whew, isn't that a fun one? We could look at... Uh, <clears throat> How this, we can look at various aspects. What happens to the rich young ruler? Does it, what happens to him down the road? There are so many fun questions that come out of this scripture. But for today, I just want to just focus on this moment. Jesus says to this rich young fellow, sell everything and follow me. And the guy turns and walks away. He says no. And it's not like... You know how often you talk to someone and you have this conversation and you walk away and you think, you know, if only I'd said the right thing, if only I hadn't said so much, if only I had said this instead of that, I beat myself up over that often. I'll go out and I'll meet people and I'll, I'll you know, Andy, just shut up. Stop talking so much. Or, or you know, I, just, I, I hate awkward silences, so I, I try to fill the silence. And it, it's not like that happened here, though. You know, I've invited people to church and gotten shot down. It happens. But this is Jesus. Jesus didn't mess this up. Jesus is not sitting there thinking, well, you know, if only I'd said the right words, this guy would have done it. No. Jesus gave the most perfect invitation that could be given, and the dude said no. And he walks away. I found myself thinking about this moment when I was challenged with a question. It, it happened here. Yeah, I was questioned, and, and here's the question I was asked. Does God ever turn anyone away? Fun question, right? Does God ever turn anyone away? And my mind went to this passage, because I wanted to start thinking about this. Because we know what our initial response, when you're asked, hey, does God ever turn anyone away? You know what your initial response is? Of course not, right? No one, God would never turn anyone away because God's kind of like our grandpa who's like a little bit older and white hair and a little bit frail, but really nice. God would never turn anyone away. Uh, well, is that the God of popular imagination or is that the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God uh, who calls people to holiness to follow him? If we want to understand how to answer this question, we've got to ask, what type of things does God do? And how do we, just take a step back, how do we know what type of person God is? If you want to know about who God is, it turns out you look at Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, if you want to know the Father, know me. If you know me, you know the Father. If you want to know more about who God is and what God does, you pay attention to what Jesus is and what Jesus does. Because if you know the Son you know the Father. You ever have that experience where you've known someone for 20 years and then you meet their, their parents and you go, yeah. yeah that, that, that's what's happening here. That's the logic of this. You know, my dad walks in the door. You've never seen him before. He gets up there and talk, starts speaking. In five minutes, you'll have him pegged, right? That's Andy's dad, and, and, and rightfully so. And that's what the logic of this. Jesus says, if you want to know God, if you want to know who God is, if you want to know the Father, you, know, you pay attention to the Son, you pray, and the Holy Spirit will move, and together you'll know who God is. And so if we want to know, would God turn anyone away, we've got to start by looking at, at the Son real closely. Jesus the Son. And so what does Jesus do here? Does Jesus turn the person away? I don't think so. I think what's happening here is Jesus says to this per he gives this person an invitation, follow me, and then he tells them, and here are the expectations. He gives them an invita invitation, follow me, then follows it up with an expectation. If you're going to follow me, this is what you need to do to, 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 to follow me. And then the guy turn, turns away. And the difference in what, when someone 
turns away and someone is asked to leave. I mean, they look kind of, they look very similar because someone is still leaving either way, but there's a very important difference here. Jesus doesn't turn this fellow away. Jesus invites him. The guy decides to turn away. This is like when the shepherd goes to find the lost sheep, finds him in the sheep, and tells the sheep, that's the flock, let's go back that way, and the sheep keeps on going farther and farther away no, anyways. I mean, that's what's happening here. As I read scripture, what I see in the ministry of Jesus is I never see him turning anyone away. But what I do see is people not saying yes to his invitation. And every invitation has the expectations that go with it. And so Jesus says, follow me to the young man. And this is the expectations for doing so. It's the same thing when God calls the Hebrew people to cross the desert. What does he do to them first? He gives them the expectations. We call them the Ten Commandments. And we still live by that logic today. Everyone is invited to baptize your children here. And then expected to raise your children in the church. Everyone is invited to come to communion. And expected to love God to confess your sins and to forgive and to live at peace with each other. Everyone is invited to be part of this church. And as part of being part, a member of this church, you are expected to gather to worship, to give sacrificially, to grow in your faith, and to, and to then share that faith with others. Any couple is invited to come here and to ask God's blessing upon their marriage and expected to worship as a couple. If you're going to get married here, you better be worshiping somewhere, preferably here. Right? And so every invitation that we have as a church, every invitation Jesus offers, is matched to a set of expectations. Jesus invites every single person just as they are, but is never done with them. Not with you, not with me. So Jesus invites everyone and then has expectations about what happens next. The, the most pure statement of this we find is when Jesus says, anyone who follows me must take up their cross. Follow me, going to carry a cross. So does God turn anyone away? No. God invites, and people choose to accept that invitation or not. And as I said, there are so many other questions we could deal with with this. I mean, does everyone have to give away what this guy's asked? Why does Jesus say, don't call me good? I mean, we can get into the weeds of all that another sermon. But just today, I, I want to, to leave you with this, this idea that Jesus invites everyone. And every invitation has expectations that go with it. Now, I began by saying... Every pat, pat, we remember passages because they resonate with us, because they, they, they connect to us somehow. The reason this connects to me, the reason I never forget this passage, is because it authorizes me, it empowers me to try, to go out and to invite people just like Jesus did, and also reminds me that sometimes I'm going to fail. If Jesus couldn't get everyone to say yes, there ain't no way I'm going to get everyone to say yes. But Jesus can try and be clear about it. Follow Jesus. Follow me. Here are the expectations. Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. I can do the same. So can you. Sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it won't. That's about how it worked for Jesus too. Amen.